Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, listen, I have made a promise to a brother, Brother Manuel, that I'm going to call him. And uh, I am, uh, Brother Manuel, God bless you, brother. I love you very much. And I am definitely going to be getting up with you very soon. A lot of you guys are going to be blessed uh, with the connection that I have with Brother Manuel. I've known him for many, many years now. And, uh, but, I got so deep into this discovery of this message, and it's just, it's taken longer and longer and longer to put it together, but, and, and very tempting to want to address some of the issues, uh, especially at hand that's going on in the current news with Israel, with Gaza, everything like that, because some of the scriptures that I'm going to be talking about here kind of touch on that issue too. Uh, but I'm going to save that for a different message this week, because I'm going to be doing some teachings that I want to share with you. Uh, but this one, though, is a discovery that I've made. And as far as I am aware of, no one has ever connected the dots here. Uh, but it also opened a lot of other new information for me as well. And the question is, which tomb was Jesus really buried in? Now, some people are going to argue the Holy Sepulchre. Others say the Garden Tomb. Then there's going to be others that say neither one. Uh, they're just a possibility. But I think I may have actually come across a scripture that identifies the real tomb where Jesus was buried in. And yes, actually, one of these two could very well fit the description. Uh, we're going to look into this whole thing, and I'm going to share a couple of other insights with you as we go here. Uh, I know it'll be a blessing for you. I've been to both these tombs here many, many times uh, since 2004 when I lived in Israel initially. And then subsequently, many more times after that, I've been to Israel many, many times in my life. Uh, I, I haven't even caught, kept up with a count of it. To the right is the garden tomb. I put to the left here the holy sepulcher there with that great question of which tomb is it. And uh, so also, too, besides that, though, I want to share with you a couple of other things here just as we're looking at the tombs here. Uh, this is the garden tomb. If you are if you walk up there on the outside there, oddly enough, it's very close to the place, as they call it, Golgotha, or the uh, the place of a skull. Uh, it is right here where you can kind of see us. It's not as prominent as it was years ago, but it looks like two eyes right here, uh, the nose on the side of the mountain there. And this is believed, of course, there is a Muslim cemetery at the top here. This is believed to be where executions were done just outside the Damascus Gate. And uh, and it is also believed, Ron Wyatt, uh, according to his, uh, his, from what he said himself, and I have actually seen uh, the stone that he pulled from the base of where he found where a, uh, a no doubt a cross was placed at that, uh, that, appeared to be bloodstained. I'll just say it that way there. Mary Lou Wyatt uh, became a very close friend of ours. Uh, it was very interesting to say the least what he discovered. And it's not far from here. In fact, literally where you take the picture out here, right by this bus station, is taken from a part of the garden tomb uh, facility there. And the reason why they call it the garden tomb is because there is uh, this one, I think it's the second largest cistern ever found in Israel, and a wine press was there. So it was obviously a actual garden at one time, or a vineyard of some sort there. And uh, you don't see it here, but right about where this picture would be taken from, just behind you is the actual wine press, and just to the right there again, the underground cistern, just massive in size there. So there's a lot of things that, that people have suggested that the garden tomb may in fact actually be the tomb. Even right here on the picture, you're not going to see it here probably, but uh, there's a trough going along right there um, where they have the, uh, uh, where the stone was rolled into place there. There is a spike in the wall that they finally carbon dated. Uh, later, they believe that that, that, that particular um, print is actually a uh, uh, dated to be the spike that held or sealed the stone in place. So yes, very well could be. Um, and this is going inside the tomb. Now, they actually had to cut out this section here. The visiting section where you're at is the normal height and everything. But it was a much shorter space right here 
where the body would be placed at uh, when you would come inside the tomb. Now what you don't see here very well, which I, you can see some a little bit in here in this picture here, is down here on the bottom left here. And I remember back years ago, uh, in 2004, I was there and there was a man that was telling us about this tomb. And he said that whoever owned the tomb initially must have not have been the guy that was buried there because they had to hastily carve out about another foot in order for the person that was going to be buried there to fit. That was one of their beliefs that this could very well be the tomb. This could be uh, uh, the tomb that was used for Jesus because, as we know from the scripture, Jesus wasn't the first one to be there. You know, the scripture says here, we're in uh, the book of John chapter 19, Joseph of Arimathea, he was the one that actually owned the tomb. And as we read right here, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this here. We're going to back up and look at it a little bit more. Uh, he besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave, and he came and therefore and took the body of Jesus. Uh, also, too, uh, let's see here. Looking for the part where it says, Never a man had laid, but one of the soldiers with spear pierced his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. Boy, gosh, how many times you guys heard me teach on that one from John chapter 4 about the woman at the well and how that, uh, you know, she's, uh, he, Jesus says, Bring me to drink. And she says, Sir, the well is deep, uh, you know. You know, and uh, well, we'll go into that a little bit later. For anyway, for these things were done in this. Let's see. And he, he that saw it bear record, and the record is true. He that knoweth that the saith the truth, that you might believe. For these things were done that scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. That's important right there. Do you know how many people are saying that that scripture has not been fulfilled? They say that Israel is blind even unto this day and that they're going to look upon him. They're quoting, I think it's in Zechariah. They'll look upon him whom they have pierced and they shall weep as a, as a family that lost their only son. And yet, according to the Gospel of John, that scripture was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And after this, Joseph of Amarathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight. They Then they took the body of Jesus, wound it in a linen clothes with the spices as the manner of Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. As I said, it's called the garden tomb because of the uh, huge cistern and the fact of an olive press there. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. So it's believed that the tomb was carved out for Joseph of uh, Arimathea, and that Jesus undoubtedly was taller because, like I said, Obviously, as they pointed out to me, uh, one of the people from the garden tomb there, when they were doing the tour on it, they said it was dug out bigger, about a foot longer than what the guy was that originally owned it. Anyway, they're laid there. There they laid Jesus there for, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. As the other thing they bring out, as I showed you a minute ago, Golgotha was right there, right there around the corner of the garden. Joseph has a tomb. But even though we have all this evidence, no one has fully been persuaded that this was the tomb of Jesus. Although very clearly it does meet a lot of scriptural evidences that we have. That is until I ran across a scripture here in Isaiah chapter 28, which we already know about the cornerstone. Jesus being the cornerstone is written there. But there is another verse. And it's a verse, I believe, that will clearly identify that the garden tomb really is the authentic tomb for where the body of Jesus was actually laid to rest. Of course, the resurrection is the best part, right? 
Let me share with you, though, this here. And, and there I came, I came across some more incredible things as well. Um, in fact, what I may do, I may take you to the, to the key point, and then we're going to back up and look at some other issues on this. We'll do that. We'll start, we'll read the whole thing. I'll get to the important part for you, but then we're going to back up because I saw some amazing things in Isaiah 28 that we've been overlooking as well, besides this important clue that identifies the very tomb that Jesus was placed in. Verse 14, Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, the ballad mongers of this people, which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with the netherworld are we at agreement. When the scouring scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. And in falsehood have we hid ourselves. Boy, if you don't see the crucifixion of Christ and what they were doing to him in these words here, I'll be shocked. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, tri a tried stone, a costly cornerstone of sure foundation. He that, sh he that believes shall not make haste, and I will make justice the line, and righteous the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with the netherworld shall not stand. When the scouring scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. As often as it passes through, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass through, by day and night, and it shall be sure terror to understand the message. We'll have to go back and translate that properly, verse 19. But this is the key right here. For the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself, and the covering too narrow when he gathereth himself up. For the Lord will rise up, as in Mount Perazim, and he will be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, strange as his work, and bring to pass his act, strange as his act. Now therefore be ye not scoffers, lest you your bands be made strong, for an extermination wholly determined have I heard from the Lord, the God of hosts, upon the whole land. Now, we're going to break down a lot of this and look at it, but this is the part that's really the pinnacle piece of evidence that I don't know if anybody has ever paid attention to. All right. Now we know that God, we know the scripture, the New Testament clearly identifies that Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a costly cornerstone for a sure foundation. We all know that Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. What's interesting, though, is God says, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. Isad. He nene Isad betzion even. He lays down. This is literally the foundation of the cornerstone itself has to be laid. It has to be placed. He's literally talking about placing him in a grave. But what's fascinating to me is when we get down here to verse 20, for the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself. And then I remembered... The bed is too short for a man to stretch himself, right? And then I remembered, as they point out, and so you can see, if you look at this rock closely right there, you can see, let me see how much more I can blow this up for you guys. Here we go. Yeah, you can actually, you get a pretty good view here. You see that little, they carved out going into the wall right there. You can see like a little lip here at the bottom here. The little lip is where originally the tomb was dug out, only to there. 
And then somebody had to go in here and dig out about a foot more than what was laying in there. And by the way, it's very short to begin with. So whoever it was dug out for initially, guy was only probably five, two to five foot four, something along that lines. I forget what they said, but it was something, it was a short guy. And Jesus must have been a little bit taller, maybe 5'8", five, 5'10", five, something like that. Another half a foot or something like that. So the, the tour guide there said they had to carve out a bigger space because obviously Jesus was taller than just, uh, uh, Joseph, or, excuse me, yeah, Joseph, the guy that was actually that the tomb belonged to. And that's always stuck in my mind. I don't know why it's stuck there, but it's always stuck in my mind that this was the case at the garden tomb. And then we, we find this out, you know, we find out that at the garden tomb, that's the case. And then I come across this scripture through another research I was doing. For the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself. And yet everything above this in Matthew, or excuse me, Isaiah 28, is all about the crucifixion, the hatred that the Jews had for him, etc. Notice what it says, verse 15, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with the netherworld are we at agreement. Oh yeah, they were definitely at agreement. I'll prove that to you. Watch this here. This is Ariel Sadok, the famous rabbi from the History Channel, you know, and maybe, gosh, maybe Ariel, if he if he really began to listen to some of the things I say, I know he's got a lot of Christian friends. He actually lives here in Tennessee as well. Appreciate that about him. But watch what he says here, right? Watch what he says about the reptilians. Now, in this video here, he talks about inner earth. He talks about the seraphim. He talks about them all being uh, of God. And they're from where? Inner earth, right? Listen to this. Mr. Teen at Roswell gave them a full debriefing telepathically. Well... We still communicate telepathically with all of these other entities. There was a race of highly evolved reptilians who matured and evolved on Earth and have since ascended. And they presently serve Hashem, God. And they are reptilian entities, maybe evolved dinosaurs, who knows? I don't think the dinosaurs were so 65 million years ago. They were probably a lot, lot closer than that. But aside from that, an evolved reptilian race. They are referred to as, in the Sefiyat Sira, they're referred to as the Teli, T-E-L-I. I write all about this. You, know, you go search this out. Sefiyat Sira says that they rule in this universe like a king on his throne. They're the reptilians. We know who they are. And they know us. We know them by different names. The book of Daniel calls them the Irin, the Watchers. The book of Isaiah refers to them as the Seraphim. Now, the Seraphim are the ones who are in the palace of God saying Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. So they're pretty high up there in the order. But people say, oh, the word seraphim, that means burning ones. And I feel like taking the head and giving somebody a whack on the side of the head, saying, that's what you get for not understanding Hebrew correctly. The Hebrew word for burning is so rough. We'll pause it there. I'll put the link in the description for you so you can listen more because it goes into the inner earth, things like that. On the History Channel, this is where I first uh, discovered uh, where Ariel Tzedak talked about that help for the Jews will come from inner earth. And yet, oddly enough, in the book of Isaiah, we have made a covenant with death and with the netherworld are we at agreement. When the scouring scourge shall pass through, it shall not come uh, unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood have we hid ourselves. I find that fascinating in itself because, yes, they brought false witnesses against Jesus in order to have him crucified. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a costly cornerstone of sure foundation. He that believes shall not, uh, shall not make haste. And I will make 
justice the line of righteousness to plummet. The hell shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. I think when it speaks about the waters shall overflow the hiding place, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that when his side was pierced and the water did come forth from his side, the hiding place was the body in which Jesus, the very God of heaven, had hid himself inside of that body. And the water shall overflow the hiding place. Because why? He was pierced in his side. Let's look at John again there, right? Let's back up. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that sought bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith this truth, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So don't put that scripture as a future, thinking Israel's eyes are going to suddenly come open. The Jewish people have the ability for their eyes to come open at any time down through the last 2,000 years. That's why you need to witness to them. But the woman at the well, right? She's the one. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus saith unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you, you, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence you, uh, have you this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and the children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto, him, unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now we know the story. She wants the, the water, you know. He tells her to go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. He said, you told the truth. You've had five. The one you live with now is not yours. And she said, you know, she finally she goes, Woman, believe me, he, Jesus says, The hour comes when you shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now he is, the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Not at Jerusalem. The God that lives within you, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory in you. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, he gave her all these beautiful signs. I wouldn't doubt a single bit in the world if she wasn't there the day they pierced his side and then she knew that what he said was true. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, that's when the waters of life was poured upon the people. So going back over here to Isaiah, we find out that that water overflowed. Right? Unbelievable. So, in your covenant with death, he goes on to say, and by the way, there it is there, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. That hiding place was Christ himself. He was the one hiding in that place. And your covenant with death, now he goes back to Israel speaking to them, shall be disannulled, and your agreement with the netherworld shall not stand. Jesus called the Pharisees of his day reptilians. And sadly, Ariel Sadok still believes the reptilians are good guys. When the scouring scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Now, I'm talking about you, you all. That's why I got it highlighted in green. The them. Then you, it will all be to you all, will be trodden down. That scourge is after they, they scourged Jesus Christ, when they beat him. He laid his own life down. God put him, he was a cornerstone that was laid down in the tomb. And as we see here, for the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself. It was too short for him to be stretched into it, but God 
They just had to hew the, 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 the tomb a little bit bigger. As often as it is passed through, it shall take you. For the morning by morning shall it pass through. By the day by, you know, they're going to be trodden down. That was what happened in 70 AD. And But it didn't just stop there. God said, as often as it passes through, it shall take you. From morning by morning shall it pass through by day and by night, and it shall be a sheer terror to understand the message. Literally, Ragzara, it'll be an only kind of terrifying thing to divinely hear. Habin Shamua. Now they put on there a sheer terror to understand the message. But it's like, it's almost as if what God is saying, it would take a divine understanding to hear. Almost to wake up. And the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself. I think it's interesting. There it is right there. Habin Shemua. And again, it does take a divine understanding. To see something so simple. For the Lord will rise up as in Mount Perazim. This is just absolutely astounding to me. To see that. And then to, to, to see. Not only does it say the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself. And then to know that at the garden tomb. They had to cut the tomb out bigger. Because it wouldn't the body of the person that was the way they put it the body of the person that was actually buried there was taller than the one it was dug out for and they figured it was done in haste no doubt I'm Stephen Benoon here watching Israeli News Live I really pray this message is a blessing for you I believe that somehow or another God will bless your heart from that uh, thank you and thank you for those of you that support the work we do here uh I really appreciate your support. And like I said, we're going to be sharing some more things over on Patreon. So if you want to support the work via Patreon, please do so. EMP Shield, INL50 is the code. If you decide you want to get something like that for your uh, for your vehicle, for your home, et cetera, we appreciate that. Those are little ways that help support the work we do here. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for listening. I know Yana is getting ready to write a article too for IsraeliNewsLive.org. That is the way to donate. You'll see our address on there, Denon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872, or in my name, Stephen Benoon. And, uh, or you can click right there online. And if you're watching on iConnect FX, there's an easy donate online button right there. Very easy to use the one on iConnect as well. So we appreciate you very much. And thank you for the time that you spend uh, coming and, and joining us here. By the way, according to rabbis, it's not a conspiracy. That video I did there, wow, that is a shocking eye-opener for sure as well. Be sure, go back and look at that video. I know you will definitely be blessed by this. Uh, we find out from Rabbi Fink there, the Kazarian doctrine is really true. The doctrine of Khazars, Jewish Khazars being descendants of the Khazars is very true. Now, I've always believed, though, regardless of the, the way, that, I mean, because a lot of people really beat up the Ashkenazis because of it. It's just more of a watered-down bloodline is what it is, whereas your um, Sephardic or your uh, Mitzrahi Jews, mostly your Mitzrahi Jews that are from uh, the Middle East, are, are more pure bloodlines. Even Palestinians, about 50% of Palestinians are actually uh, Jewish descent. They are from the original um, farmers that were able to stay there during the Roman uh, conquest. So uh, anyway, I'm Steve Benoon. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. God bless you and have a great evening.